you know, so I said to myself, okay, what am I going to do? You know, I'm talking about during the confinement, we couldn't go out, you know, and I, and I start cooking and things I haven't done for a long time, you know, taking the time to make an onion soup at home. And reconnecting with, with that made me realize what I love, and I love cooking. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. COVID-19 is indiscriminate, and the impact on those in the hospitality sector, no matter how big, how small, how influential, or how young, has been significant. With many challenges ahead, how are those that created our culinary landscape over generations seeing the new era ahead? Guillaume Brahimi is one of Australia's most influential chefs and restaurateurs and owner of Bistro Guillaume. Mate, how are you going? Man, Anthony, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. Monday morning, raining in Sydney. Uh, another week. It's been a pretty crazy period of time. Um, how, how have you felt during this last couple of months with the pandemic and your restaurants forced to close? Well, it's been some uh, up and down, you know. Uh, um, you know, like uh, it, it's something we never had before. So, um, you know, there was the first few weeks you worry what's going on. Uh, um, the restaurant are closed. Uh, no contact, like, you know, the normal uh, uh, meetings of uh, the, how did we go last night, the report of the, the everyday uh, life of restaurants. And, and, uh, and after that, that, that was one week. After that, uh, professionally, you know, like having your restaurant closed with all the, the worry about uh, the cash flow and how are we going to, to survive, and after that, there is, uh, you know, JobKeeper happen, and we we needed to find some funding to to help, you know, to to fund the first few the first months of JobKeeper, and we did that. And after that, there is a stress of the staff who are not uh, eligible for JobKeeper, and what can you do for them? And um, yeah, it sounds like. He hasn't stopped, you know what I mean? Like we can't believe we nearly end of July, we're talking March. You know, six months ago, the first case of Corona was in Australia, I think. That's something like that. Um, and, and and on top of that, you obviously, you got your family life, your personal life, you, your um, kids doing HSA, kids working from home, kids at uni on the campus, you know, like, uh, and on top of that, you got your family in France, <laughs> uh, parents who are getting older and you're starting to worry. And the craziness is, you know, I left, I arrived in Australia uh, early 90s and, and I never had uh, a worry of when when do I need to go to France because you can always you know <laughs> you just book a ticket and you go. But like that's the first time now. I've got. Well, you know I can go. How do you feel about your homeland now? Is do you have a stronger connection to it and a yearning to be there? Absolutely. Ah, uh, ah. Uh, uh, you know, and and the craziness of it, Anthony is. Um, you know, so I said to myself, okay, what am I going to do? You know, I'm talking about during the confinement, we couldn't go out, you know, and I, and I start cooking. But cooking um, in a different way of meaning uh, getting the, the produce, bring them at home and starting from scratch and things I haven't done for a long time, you know, taking the time to make an onion soup at home, taking the time to make so many dishes then normally I don't have time, and reconnecting with you know with with that made me realize how what I love and I love cooking, and you know like I was just giving you know making onion soup and enough for all my neighbors, <laughs> lucky neighbors. Yeah, they're, they're quite happy, I have to say. <laughs> uh, never got anything dropped on my door, but that's okay. 
Um, and I started making some soup for the for an hospital in Sydney, just for the the cleaners and you know the, the not the star of the hospital, but the workers, you know, like the the cleaners and the drivers and all of that. So we start make we made that for about five weeks from my house, making fifty portion of soup in a, not a commercial kitchen. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I realize, you know, how much I. I love cooking and sharing it. You know, that's really made me realize that's what I love about what I do, is starting from scratch, using the produce, cooking it, and sharing it, you know, giving it to people. And um, on, on the other part is I realize all these, you know, like I'm so lucky uh, to where I come from and the people who teach me, you know, like I've got, I've got the foundation of, of French cuisine in part of my heritage. Mm. And, and, you know, we made a, I think the first, and I start doing Zoom and I start doing, I'll I, I tell you how busy I've been, but like I start doing little bit of Instagram TV and you know the first one I did uh, I did a two ice bake souffle like should I try something easier like, <laughs> but it worked it worked yeah. because I know how to do them I, I I respect the recipe and respect the produce and we do you know what I mean like that's that's like I'm lucky things will sound so normal to me about how to make a chicken jus, you know, how to make, to braise a lamb shoulder, how to, to fillet a fish. And, and all these things are, are not neglected, but I took it for granted. Why did you become a chef? Ah, uh, um, how that come? That's a, I started cooking at 15 now, huh? and I'm turning 53 now. And, um, I, I have tough time at school. School was not an happy place for me. Uh, dyslexic, and finding it very, very hard. Everything academic for me was horrible. And it's not like I was not trying to learn. It was just didn't go in. And um, I remember, you know, I was petrified when the report were sent to my parents' house. And I always remember coming home and saying, oh, my God, this is, you know, I couldn't think anything. It, it was a disaster. And I used to open the door of my home and I could smell the roast chicken. I, I could smell uh, the stew, the lamb, stew, the Navarrean stew, the lamb stew. Um, and But this roast chicken keep coming back to me like, and it was cold winter, and I walked in. I can smell the roast chicken. I'm saying, "Wow, pff, it's not that bad." If Mum cooked the lamb, the roast chicken, everything's okay. And that was like my security blanket, you know, because we 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 come from a family. We sit down every night. We will have free course every night. You know, Mum would make an entree. It might be a soup in winter, roast chicken for main course with a salad, cheese, and a yogurt for dessert with jam, you know. But like I was saying to myself, oh, everything's okay. I got three out of 20 in math, but the roast chicken was sitting down at the table, and the joy of the food was was like my like I keep coming back to the security blanket but it was my everything's okay and and it keep growing on me and I'm talking about when I was 12 that so 12 13 14 and I was very very lucky my parents are in the medical world so nobody cooked in my family but my my parents used to go to free star michelin because that's the way we live in France you know you celebrate in great restaurants and we my dad can cook an egg, but my dad on a Saturday would go, and I used to go with him, we would drive 20 kilometers to go to this market because they've got the best fromager who's got the best cottages. 
And after that, we will drive another 30 kilometers to go to this other fromager who's got the best uh, Comté. Wow. And that's the way we live, you know. Um, we, we used to go, the bread, I was very close to my grandparents. My grandmother used to buy bread for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. <laughs> And I always remember when I arrived in Australia, my grandmother never took the plane, you know, she never left. Or she only left France once to my wedding in England. But like, you know, she said to me, how's Australia? And I said, oh, mommy, you're not going to believe me. They've got bread already cut with a use by date. And she said, oh, I understand. But she didn't. She said, like, she said oh, what's happening to my son? You know, like, <laughs> um, you know, like I, I know that's cliche, but that's uh, Sunday lunch. Doesn't matter what time we come home on a Saturday night, being young kids, you know, a teenager, we have a Sunday lunch. And it was aperitif, glass of champagne. I have my first glass of, you know, quarter of a champagne and a Bordeaux at 14. That's, you know, and we have entree, main course, dessert. And we always have family lunch, and my parents were amazing. They used to ask us at 4 p.m. if we can bring one or two friends over for the dessert. So we used to have this great discussion between my three brothers, friends, and sister, you know. So we ended up being 12, 14, 16, 18 people for dessert of every different age, and we talk, you know. So... Everything was about the food. Uh, uh, not, we didn't talk about food, but food was there. Yeah. You know, like I, I, I what a privilege um, to have always four or five cheese in the fridge. You know, like people are like, oh, wow, what are you having a dinner party? No, we used to have that Monday to Sunday. That was four or five cheese. And each of my siblings would have a favorite cheese. So my parents used to buy their favorite cheese. Um, we, you know, like we, we made such a big thing here in Australia about the, the season. And, you know, it's coming. It's great at the moment. We're talking about that. But where I come from, we, we, we went to the market, open market, to buy the produce. So they're always in season. We always buy in season. Do you know what I mean? You don't find asparagus in winter at the market in France. Because it's coming from the grower who live 30 kilometers max from the market. So you're getting the produce of the season. And it's in the DNA of the French. We, so why, I, I know, I, I'm not uh, forgetting the question, uh, by the way, <laughs> Anthony. I'm just, I'm just yeah. telling you my surrounding. Yeah. Uh, I grew up, I can remember what was the first time I went to the market because we used to go to the market Wednesday, Saturday, Sunday. And that was that, that fond memory of mine. Uh, trying the olives. Um, going to buy the mushroom and the woman who sells the mushrooms got dirt in her nails. Going to buy the raspberry in spring and the woman's got red in her nails because she picked the the mure, the the blackberry. You know what I mean? Like that's buying the the butter with a knife because they've got like five kilo block of butter and you pick the butter you like. So. Um, at 14, I said to my dad, you know, I'm, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to go to school anymore because it was very important, you know, like moving. It, you can stay to the HSC in a school in France. You know, you find a school, it costs money and you end up staying and year 12 happened and, <laughs> and, and it's, you don't know what you're doing, but you went to year 12. But I said to my parents, that's it, I want to cook. And because my dad was such a bon vivant and have, have friends and they were a good customer to some of his restaurant, uh, for my uh, school holiday, Christmas holiday, as a 14 years old, uh, I went to work at La Tour d'Argent 
for two weeks as a work experience. Uh, La Tour d'Argent was three star Michelin at the stage. Uh, do you know the La Tour d'Argent, Anthony? Yeah. So that's a restaurant on top of. Like, yeah, it's you know one of the greatest restaurant in. They do the famous duck, the pressed duck, and so I spent two weeks there as a fourteen years old. And my dad used to pick me up, and he didn't do crazy hours. I did uh, nine to four, but as a fourteen years old, I was exhausted, but I was so proud. So proud to tell my dad my day. And I, I, I tell you one of the most amazing thing happened to me is they asked me to make, they were making fine apple tart. I still do it these days, but make a small apple tart. And they asked me to make one. I was in pastry. And I made one and they let me bake it. They showed me how to bake it. And they say, you should take it home. And for the first time in my life, I bought something I was proud of. It was not math report or English report. It was my Apple Tart, and it was a, you know, it was not a ten out of ten, but for me, it was a twenty out of ten. And for me to give that to my dad and my mum, my chest was up. Like I was, do you know what I? I, I was proud. I, I went like, oh my god. And obviously, I didn't think about the 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 effect of it, but it was me bringing something from my work at my parents and showing them that I was better than just a, a kid who didn't have good results at school. And went back to school and Easter holiday happened and my dad said, I've got another stage for you. And I said, oh, thanks dad, I'm so happy where? And there was a restaurant who just opened in Paris called Jamin. And this restaurant was the first restaurant of Monsieur Robuchon. And as a 14 years old, I spent two weeks there. I didn't say a word. I was petrified because Germain was a very hard kitchen. La Tour d'Argent was a big kitchen with a lot of different rooms. But Robuchon was a small kitchen and everybody was there. And, you know, I was a 14 years old. And uh, when my dad picked me up for the last day, I... Anthony, I remember the smell of the restaurant when I was waiting. I've, I, you know, I worked four and a half years there. Wow. Oh, you don't know, but like, I worked four and a half years there. A few years later, I went back, and i never been in the dining room. I went, I, went, I went to the dining room two times, the first day of my stage and the first day when I got employed. And I can remember the smell of the dining room. And Robuchon, so my dad went to pick me up, and um, I was proud. <laughs> and uh, my dad said, thank you, Mr. Robuchon, to have my son. You have to realize, um, rest, chefs were, you know, the Bocuse, Oiseau were coming up. You know what I mean? You're talking about early 80s. This is the start of of what happened to the Nouvelle Cuisine, etc., in France. And Robuchon says something to my dad, and I, and I remember that to the day I die. He said, um, you know your son? Look at this wall, there is a watch. There was a big clock. And he said to my dad, I look at him all day the last two weeks, and he didn't look once at the clock. And yeah. And I, I know it doesn't mean a lot, but for me, it meant the world. And so I uh, finished school in June, and in September, I started an apprenticeship in a small bistro in Paris. We used to go to Rangis once a week, 3 a.m. start to 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> and going to Rangis was, as, as a 16 years old, I was the proudest kid up there. You know, Brange is the biggest market in the world. And I finished my apprenticeship in two years, and I went back to La Tour d'Argent as a commis. And I spent uh, two years there, and I always remember uh, Dominique Boucher, the chef there. By the way, we were three-star Michelin at the time. Do Dominique Boucher called me on a Friday in his office, the chef, and I went to see him. He said, um, I think you spend enough time with us. I want you to go there. And he was on the phone. He was on the phone with Robuchon. 
And he told Robichon, uh, I've got someone for you. And Robichon asked to see me that Friday afternoon. I went to Jamin. And Robichon uh, welcomed me into his, li his little office. And he had a letter right by Dominique Boucher. And he asked for me to read it. And I read it. It was a very, it was a very nice letter. And he said, I was going to put you in a ladder, but I'm going to put you on charge of the fish section. But first, you need to learn the fish section here, but I want you to become the, on charge of the fish. And I said, yes, Mr. Robichon, I haven't had a holiday for a year and a half, okay? And so I was thinking, perfect, I leave La Tour d'Argent, take a few weeks holiday, and, and um, I start at Robichon. And he looked at me, he said, okay, you've got the job. Uh, I, see, I see on Monday, 8 a.m. <laughs> so, and I said, we chef. <laughs> and and uh, just before I left, he called me and he said, and he took one of his old diary and he went to the March 19, I can remember, and it was uh, Stagiaire Guillaume Brahimi. He said, I know who you are. You were here you know, a few years ago and he showed it to me. And I went to see Dominique Boucher, and I told him, uh, he asked me to start on Monday. He said, great, take Sunday off. <laughs> <laughs> so I was at, yeah, I took Sunday off. And on Monday, I was at, 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 at Jamin, and um, the person on charge of the fish was a friend of mine I work with at La Tour d'Argent. And you will know this guy. It was Eric Ripper. Oh, wow. And I spent a year working in the fish with Eric. And Eric left to Washington, and I took over the fish section at Robichon. So, what led you to come to Australia? No idea. That's my. That's like <laughs> I wish I. I thought I would never leave because at one stage Robichon said to me, "Oh, you, I think I would love you to go to um, Freddy Girardet. Did you know this chef, Freddy Girardet? He was a three-star Michelin in Switzerland. They, they were saying Robichon and him were like the two. To the, the chefs, the chef was saying Freddy Girardet and Joel Robuchon were probably the two greatest French chefs. So I was like, I'm not going to Switzerland. I'm happy here. I was thinking going to Alain Sandrins. But Robuchon said, no, no, you're staying with us. And my parents meet some friends on holiday who were living in Sydney, and they invite me to come during my holidays. And I come to Australia and went like, oh my God, this is amazing. And I love rugby and all of that. And I said, oh. And I, and I said to myself, I said to my parents, I'm going to apply for a visa, you know. We see a, and I got it in one week, permanent residency. <laughs> like, now, nah, you know. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'm going to go. And my parents say, you, you, Anthony, it was re re working in France was hard. Like, like, I spent four and a half years in the kitchen, working 7 a.m. to midnight, five days a week. And so it was, you know, it was a crazy thing, but what I've been doing for the last four and a half years was crazy as well. So I went to see Robichon, and I told him I was leaving. I was going to Australia. You know what he said to me? He said, I never heard of his restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> And I saw Robichon many times after, and he said, oh, you're the, you're the star. And blah, blah. But I, I, a part of me, I'm, I'm not regretting because, you know, I love Australia. But I wonder what would happen if I would have stayed in, um, in France. When I see my friends now who were part of these four years at Robichon, they all got, you know, uh, uh, Frédéric Anton, Eric Ripper, you know, they all got three-star Michelins and... And I'm talking about pre cov you know. Mm. So, yeah. So, I'm still wondering what am I doing here. But, you know, I've got four beautiful children. And, um, and I love Australia. You had one of Australia's most influential restaurants um, at Benelong for a period yeah, of time. For f 14 years. What, 14 years. What, what was that period of time like for you? Never took it for granted. It was hard. It was a hard restaurant to run, but never took it for granted. Um, 
and when the lease uh, stop, I didn't want to. I didn't want to tender, so I didn't lose the site or anything. I just didn't tender. It was it was fourteen hard years. Um, but when I see all the the young chef who started with me and where they are now, it's nice. And and um, yeah, I always remember my 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 oldest daughter was probably four. Three, four, and she was on the bus on the bridge going to the zoo on the school excursion. And the teacher showed them the opera house and said, um, "This is the opera house, children." And the little curly hair at the back of the bus said, "No, it's not." And the teacher said, "What do you mean it's not?" So it's my dad' restaurant. <laughs> you know, like things you you keep close to your chest for a long, long time. What was dining like back then when it was when? your restaurant was at its peak compared to the way the dining landscape has been in the recent couple of years? It's amazing. It was, you know, uh, I, I think the, the, the great years, you know, I'm, uh, 2000, the Olympics, I did not have the Opera House on 2000, but I'm talking about them. Uh, the best years was uh, Rugby World Cup in Australia, and not because I'm a rugby mad, but 2003, 2004, five, you know, like Australia was booming. Australia was booming. People were spending big in restaurants. There was not an issue of um, how many books we've got tonight. We were full every night. What's been the impact on the restaurants that you do have at the moment? You have a couple of iterations of Bistro Guillaume. Um, how's the pandemic affected that? Well, I think I think the harder the hardest thing. Well, the pandemic is well. I've got two of them who are closed, and I only have Perth open. <laughs> and it's um, you know uh, Melbourne we reopen slowly, and then we have to close again. And Sydney, you know, uh, we on George Street when there is, uh, I just can reopen. For the moment, it's it's um, you know it's it's crazy. The city is empty, and um, but the, the 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 thing is, we have to realize. I think our industry was not in great shape before COVID. You know, when I say to people, oh, "Are you okay?" I say, "Well, it wasn't great before." You know, there's a lot of things we need to change. What are some of those things? Well, well, I think you know that's uh, the big elephant. You know the 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 wages pro issues. You know we need we need we need to you know they far too complicated between the breaks between the meal break between the it's very hospitality award restaurant awards or it's just you know um, it's it's very complicated and you know I, I think we don't charge enough restaurant don't charge enough. If we want to be serious about using great produce, and I must, I'm not talking truffle caviar here, Anthony. I'm talking about using the good seafood, good produce. It costs. And we, we, we haven't put a price up because we can't. There's too many restaurants. The competition is, there's too many places. So if you put your price the way it should be, you're out of the, you know, people will say you're far too expensive and you're not part of the, you're out of the competition. But, you know, um, I used to buy, uh, example, 20 kilo Desiree potato 20 years ago. I think you used to get that for, um, I think it was like $15 a kilo a bag. Or I think now it's about $40, $45. You, you know, I think we, well, when the GST happened, because we're talking about, you know, the industry at the moment, nobody put their price up by 10%. We just absorbed the GST. Or I did, and I know a lot of restaurants did. How could we? How could we? When, the, you know, there is a beer tax every six months. When you buy beer, there is a beer tax. Okay, so the brewery uh, tax. Well, I tell you what, when the this beer tax happened, do you know where the beer tax is? It's on your invoice. They put it, they pass it on. 
we should have put a price up by 10% when GST happened. But I don't think anyone did. How do you see the dining landscape moving forward? Complicated. <laughs> Complicated, and, and that's an understatement. I, I, I think we need, something needs to be done or we're going to see a lot of restaurants closing. I, I want, you know, like hopefully this, this curve is going to be managed. You know, we're going to find a vaccine or we're going to, you know, we, it's going to pass. And, uh, but we need to go back and make sure we are in better position. Um, I think we, we, we are going to see um, less big menus um, and more focus on the produce on the plate. So if you order um, beautiful whiting, what well, you're getting a whiting and maybe you, are, you might have to get the sides you want for it. Mm. But like, you know, like uh, it's um, every day evolve, you know, every day evolve, you know, like a way. It's a shame because Australian was in such a good, you know, like with the, the food in Australia was, is amazing. You know, like we, we are really, we were getting on the map in the world. Do you think this experience will change what you do with your restaurants moving forward? No, I think, uh, uh, you know, like uh, the thing I love the most about restaurant is the buzz, the noise, the, the, the laugh, the, the, the plate coming out of the kitchen and also seeing empty plates coming in back in the kitchen. That's what I love. Um, you know, the seating, the one and a half meter, you know, like the minimum, that's taking away the atmosphere of restaurant. So... I, I don't know what what the future holds, but I, but I believe, um, you know, restaurant will be there. You know, uh, we need to hold tight. I think. You were saying a bit earlier that you rediscovered cooking during this time. How important has that been for you, with uh, the impact that's been so heavy on your restaurants? Uh, tremendous. Like, I like. You know, if we don't come out of that and being better people, better person, like we we miss uh, we miss the six months of of you know of questioning. I I I love cooking, and you know uh, I want to have you know. Um, I love restaurants and, you know, like, um, I want to be able to dream again, you know, of, I want to open something one day who's maybe I'm more involved in the kitchen and it's more simple food in a way of maybe no menus and the menu change every week in a way of, you know, no choice. Maybe, maybe no, no wine list and, uh, you know, 400,000 wine stock, you know, maybe, uh, every week the wine change. You say today, the, you know, this week we pick two wine, one white, one red, and we think that's great with the food we are doing. Do you know what I mean? I think we talk to the producer, what's good this week? Oh, I've got great asparagus. Great. Veg vegetable for this week is asparagus. What's dessert? Oh, I've got some amazing uh, mangoes. Okay, we do a mango dessert. Uh, I've got some great semolade chicken. Great. You know, like, I, I, and I want, Anthony, what's important is we need to get away from the factory of a kitchen, you know, like the guy who cooks the fish every day, boom, 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 boom. Like, by changing the menu every week, you get the excitement of you guys. So we are cooking this week um, and, and next week it's something else. So you don't have time to get bored. Do you know what I mean? You get excited about it. And, and you know, if people don't like uh, asparagus, they can come next week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
uh, I don't um, I don't eat that but sorry <laughs> go go to my other friends who've got restaurant you know I, I want to I want to uh, that's what I want to do I want to have my my bistros doing great classic French food with Australian produce and I would love a little place or something special when I can just focus with the best of the best. Meaning the best, you know, at the moment. <laughs> I don't know if you try the bluefin tuna at the moment. Well, I want bluefin tuna on my That would be the fish for the week. And next week, I speak to Con. I say, what's good, Con? And maybe I do lamp in spring. So, so they, they're the exciting things, you know. Like I made a, I made a, I've been loving making tartata because I was a kid and I was in charge of making tartata during my apprenticeship in the bistro. I, make two, I did make two a day for two years, five days, six days a week. And you know what? My guys in pastry try a lot of ways to make it different. And they always come back and say, can we, can, can you show us again, Guillaume? And I show them again. And like Friday, I was, <laughs> I, I, I bought some shallots and I said, I'm going to make a tat -tat with shallots. Same principle, but just made it and it was bloody delicious. And that's something I wouldn't have time to do normally, but I did it. Your influence has been extraordinary on the Australian culinary landscape. Do you have any advice for young operators? Um, you know, like we, we um, it's a difficult time at the moment. Yes, it is. But, um, you know, if they, if they love cooking, it's, it's the, you know, the joy of cooking, it's every day. You know, like you, you cook food, you serve it to people. So you, the reward are every day. I'm not talking about running the business and all of that. But I'm talking about looking at an empty plate coming back in the kitchen who's been the person who uses bread to do the sauce you, you made. You know, it's... Um, if, if, you, if, you, if you're persistent with... Um, um, if you're a waiter or do you want to be a sommelier waiter or a cook, you, 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 the, you, you're 80% there. If you're persistent and knowing it's not going to be easy, you're 80% there and listen. You know, there's plenty of time before you become a head chef. I think, I think le learning, you know, le being able to learn is one of the, you know, the great thing about cooking. Well, it's a really cold and windy day here in Canberra, and I tell you what, I wish I was one of your neighbours. You in you in you in Canberra? Is that home? It is home, and it's and it's cold, and I'd love to have your onion soup. So I was kind of wishing you were a neighbour right now. Well, mate, I'm very happy to send you some, but when <laughs> <laughs> you know what, you're not missing anything here. It's in there. it's pouring the last two days. It, the way it should be in in end of July in Australia. You want the winter. Mm. And a little bit of sun during the day doesn't hurt. Well, I might have to um, take your inspiration and make some onion soup myself. But, uh, Guillaume, it's been amazing having having you share your story today. Um, thank, thank you for picking up me, Anthony. Uh, it's always a joy to talk to you, and it's um, even more of a joy to eat your food. So hopefully um, all of your bistros open very soon, and particularly this soon restaurant that you're talking about in the future it sounds amazing oh that's 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 my dream that that's when i go to bed this one <laughs> <laughs> but you never know you never know you never know well, thanks for sharing your story mate and we'll um, <laughs> talk again soon take care have a great day anthony bye this is the deep in the weeds podcast i'm anthony huckstep stay tuned as we share the stories of australia's hospo community suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic special thanks to executive producer rob Locke for making this all happen follow us on instagram 
at Deep in the Weeds podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.